My name is Philip Bloom. I'm the June and Simon Casey Lee Curator of the Chinese Garden at the Huntington. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to the third talk in our fall 2021 East Asian Gardens Lecture Series. Thank you all so much for joining us. And I'd like to express my particular thanks to the Justin Banya Memorial Fund for supporting tonight's lecture and many of our other educational programs in the Chinese Garden. As you can see, our lecture series is still online this year and we plan to continue um, online through the spring. And as always, the lectures are recorded so you can access videos uh, a day or two after the talk is completed. Tonight's lecture by Dr. Amy McNair is part of a series on calligraphy that's meant to provide some historical and conceptual context for our exhibition that's currently on display in the Huntington's Chinese Garden. That exhibition is a Garden of Words, the calligraphy of Liu Fang Yuan. And it focuses on the original works of calligraphy and ink on paper um, that were written as models for the wooden name placards, tile inscriptions, and carved stones that adorn the garden. Over the past 15 years, we've commissioned more than 30 artists from China, Taiwan, the US, the UK, uh, to brush both name placards and poetic couplets. The exhibition uses their works to introduce calligraphy to both English and Chinese reading visitors. We begin with a discussion of what a Chinese character actually is and how it co communicates meaning. We look at the materials that are used in calligraphy and we include a few works that exemplify the the range of visual effects that artists can achieve just by varying their paper or the density of their ink. We introduce the five major script types that are used in calligraphy today. And ultimately, we include a couple of works that show some of the ways that artists are trying to innovate within this 3000 year old art form. The physical exhibition is complemented with two videos, one that shows a calligrapher writing the same character in all five script types. So you're really able to see kind of the brush dynamics and the movements of the calligrapher's hand. And a second video that consists of interviews with eight of the artists who contributed to the exhibition. As a complement uh, to the exhibition itself, we've organized a number of events, including the lecture series of which tonight's is a part, and also some um, demonstrations of calligraphy. And I very much hope, of course, everyone will be able to see the exhibition in person, but if you can't, many of the materials as well as the lectures are available online at the address that you see at the bottom of your screen. Most recently, just this past weekend, we had a calligraphy demonstration in the garden by Terry Yuan. And we're looking forward to another demonstration later uh, in the spring by Tang Qingyan in April. Tonight, though, I'm thrilled to welcome Dr. Amy McNair to speak about calligraphy in the Lingering Garden in Suzhou. Uh, Dr. McNair is professor of Chinese art at the University of Kansas, where she's taught since 1992. At Kansas, she's part of, a, I think, a remarkable art history department that currently includes four historians of East Asian art. Um, that's a number I think that's unrivaled at any other institution in the US, although it's a number that's sadly decreased in the past couple of years. Professor McNair is an expert in the history of calligraphy, particularly of the six dynasties through Song periods, but her work, as is exemplified in her three books, spans much more than that art form per se. Her first monograph, The Upright Brush, Yan Zhenqing's Calligraphy and Song Literati Politics, which was published in 1998, explores the writings of Yan Zhenqing, um, who's commonly regarded as one of the greatest regular and running script calligraphers in all of history. Actually, most students of calligraphy, including me, um, begin by copying his works. And Professor McNair's book explains why that is the case by looking at the reception of his calligraphy uh, in late, by later commentators and theorists. Her second book, uh, Donors of Longman, Faith, Politics, and Patronage in Medieval Chinese Buddhist Sculpture, which was published in 2007, uses inscriptions on sculptures at one of China's most important uh, Buddhist cave shrine sites to reconstruct the patterns of patronage that led to their creation. And many of these inscriptions became important models for calligraphers in the 18th and 19th centuries, 
But in Professor McNair's research, they also become compelling sources for writing a very vivid social history of Chinese Buddhist art. In her most recent book, which, which came out just two years ago, is an annotated and introduced translation of the Xuanhe Catalog of Paintings, which was a massive account of the imperial painting collection in the early 12th century that's been an essential reference for scholars and students of Chinese painting ever since. In translating and annotating that text so carefully, Professor McNair has rendered an enormous service to students of Chinese art history. And Professor McNair is in fact famous throughout our field for the humble service that she renders to it. She's advised dozens of graduate students. She's published widely. She's long served as the editor of Artibus Asie, one of the field's leading journals. And as a colleague of mine once noted, Professor McNair is our field's one true junzu, a gentle person of supreme character, erudition, and humility. It's really an honor to have her with us this evening. So at any time during Professor McNair's talk, please feel free to enter questions into the question and answer box that appears either at the bottom or top of your screen, depending on the device you're using. And I'll pose the questions uh, to Professor McNair at the end of her talk. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Amy McNair. Thank you, um, Philip. That was um, extremely generous, too generous, I would say. And uh, I want to thank you so much for inviting me. It was a wonderful invitation, and I have been uh, so having such a wonderful day here. And I'd like to thank you so much for inviting me, and also for the topic, which was so exciting: uh, calligraphy in the garden. Two of my favorite things. I've been teaching calligraphy for thirty years, and I have recently started to try to teach gardens of China and Japan. So this brought together for me two things that I, um, one old love and one new one. So uh, it was uh, I, it was an irresistible invitation, in other words. And after I accepted, I thought, okay, well, what am I gonna talk about? I really never pursued this subject before. So I thought, all right, Leo Yuan, wonderful garden, um, something that I have taught and used as a classic example of the scholar garden in China in, in the, the classes that I've taught on gardens. And I never really thought too much about the English language name of it, but it's, it's known as, the, as lingering garden, uh, which turned out to be kind of an interesting question. So tonight I'm gonna tell you about my little adventure diving into calligraphy in the garden and what I found out and the questions that I uh, stumbled across as I was pursuing this issue of calligraphy in Liu Yuan Garden in Suzhou. So here's my plan for tonight. Uh, first of all, I'm going to introduce the, some owners of the garden and some of the names of the garden. It's had several names over history. And I'm also going to introduce the two particular calligraphy formats that I'm going to be looking at tonight, and that is plaques and stone calligraphy slabs. Then we're going to dive a little deeper, and I'm going to talk about Liu Shu, the second known owner of the garden, and his uh, uses of calligraphy in the garden, many of which, of course, you could still see today. Then I'd like to move to Sheng Kang, uh, the owner that, that brought the garden into the 20th century, and talk about how uh, he used calligraphy in the garden. And overall, I, I have this question that came to me as I was pursuing this topic. Why is Liu Yuan translated as lingering garden? What is the original meaning of Liu Yuan? And what should the English language name be? These are the questions that uh, began to uh, assert themselves as I moved through this material. All right, an introduction to the garden. Uh, in 1997, the Chinese government put together a, a kind of a package in a bid for UNESCO uh, certification. It was called the Classical Gardens of Suzhou. And they put together nine of the most famous gardens in Suzhou. And these were presented as a unit and in 1997, UNESCO granted them World Heritage Site status. So Liu Yuan, as well as eight other prominent gardens in Suzhou, enjoy this uh, World Heritage Site status. Now, in its materials online and other, other places, UNESCO calls Liu Yuan lingering garden. I don't imagine that they made up that name. I imagine that the Chinese uh, authorities gave them that name in English. And it, it is just a little puzzling um, to 
my limited understanding, Leo means to remain. I suppose by extension, we could uh, have it mean to linger as in, as in to remain, but I, I wasn't particularly persuaded by that. And so I really was wondering what is the original meaning of this name, Leo Yuan? Uh, lingering garden is very romantic, and that, of course, immediately makes me suspect it. If it's got a romantic name like that, I figure it's uh, 20th, 21st century tourism and not something that would be coming out of a scholar garden. And when I say original meaning, what I'm saying is, what meaning did this have for its owner? All of the names in a scholar garden are full of meaning. You, you all know that, those of you who've been through the Huntington uh, Chinese garden, um, every, every, everything has a name, every view, every place, every building, everything has a name and it's all packed full of meaning. Uh, that's a, a, a key component of any scholar garden. So what meaning did it have for its original owner? And then what should the English name for this garden be? I mean, is it right to have a name that doesn't truly embody what the owner thought it meant? I mean, I could go either way on that. Anyway, what's interesting tonight, I'm gonna to talk about the history of the calligraphy in this garden. And I think the history of the calligraphy here may tell us something about the original name, the original meaning uh, of the garden's name. All right, let's go through our owners. Owner number one, a gentleman named Xu Taishi, who was a disgraced official. Although, of course, if you know the history of the Ming Dynasty, oftentimes the people who left in, dis in disgrace, so-called, were the ones who were standing up for what was <laughs> right and uh, 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 speaking out against um, bad practices and getting themselves sent away from court. So he was sent away and uh, went to Suzhou and established this garden in the year 1593. It, uh, his name for it, this is the first name for this garden, was the Eastern Garden, so-called because the um, home that he established, uh, he had a, a, a mansion with its own garden. He called that Western Garden. And so the garden that he, that, that is this garden that became Liu Yuan, he, he established that and simply called it Easter Garden because it was opposite of the other. Owner number two, this is Liu Xu, who was a retired official. He um, earned a, a degree and served in government for some years and then retired on account of illness. And he went back to Suzhou and reestablished this garden in 1797. So this is nearly 200 years later. So we could expect you know, some changes and, and uh, differences there. This man had several names for this garden. Uh, the first one is Hanbi Estate, and this is a, a new name that he gave this garden. It was a play on the old name for his family's ancestral home, which was on Dongting Dongshan, which is that kind of uh, peninsula of land that sticks out into Lake Tai that is down to the what southwest of Suzhou proper. He also had, um, in addition to a, a name honoring his family, there was another name that was uh, very um, literati oriented called Small Building in Flowery Dock, which was another name. We'll look at that more in detail later. And, and then of course, there was what everybody in town called this garden. It was popularly called the Leo Family Garden. So he had an, a number of fancy names for it, which evidently very few people used or made reference to. Owner number three, Shang Kong was a government official, a very wealthy businessman, and he purchased this garden in 1873 and spent three years uh, making renovations to it, uh, adding more land to it, making it bigger, and finally completed his work in 1876. And as you can see from this lovely old photograph, Chung Kong lived into the age in which photography was adopted in China. And so this is an image of his family, the Sheng uh, clan standing on the walkway that goes over the pond in the main part of the central part of the garden. All right, here we get, it gets interesting because what did Sheng Kong call this garden? He called it Liu Yuan, not Liu Yuan. So Liu Yuan, as it is presently known, instead of Liu family garden. Now, when Xu Taishi set up his garden, he picked a wonderful spot 
a perfect suburban location for his house and garden. Uh, the garden, I'm showing you a little uh, uh, aerial view of it here in the center. The view to the north, he could look um, through the, the uh, trees, of course there weren't any tall buildings or anything then, uh, to the north and see the pagoda on Tiger Hill. If he looked to the east, he could see uh, Chong Gate the, at the uh, northwest corner of Suzhou. He could see the walls of Suzhou, which of course exist no longer and the um, bustling mercantile area that was around there. And then immediately south of the uh, garden was a canal, one of the smaller canals, which uh, fed into the um, canals that go around Suzhou, around the city, you could go into the city, and you could also connect up to the Grand Canal and go off somewhere else. So it was um, absolutely ideally situated. Now, the iconic monument of this garden is the rock that you're looking at right now. This is the most famous rock in this garden, uh, one of the most famous garden rocks in all of China. Uh, its name is Cloud Capped Peak. It is um, 6.5 meters high. It is a towering sculptural thing. It's an incredible presence. This is um, a Lake Tai rock. These are... Um, uh, huge chunks of limestone that had been dredged up from the uh, uh, bed, the, the uh, lake bed of Lake Tai, nearby Lake Tai, with all of their wonderful um, perforations and, and uh, textures and patterns and stuff. They look very um, alive and, and sinuous. This rock has a um, rather romantic story behind it. Emperor Huizong was notorious for setting up what was called the Flower and Rock Network. And this was a, um, uh, a group of um, officials with a permission to uh, purchase, acquire, and ship um, exotic plants, uh, fancy rocks like this one. All of these things were taken up to the capital in Kaifeng to be set up in his imperial park. And in 1105, there was a uh, local office of the Flower and Rock Network set up in Suzhou. And it is said that this rock was dredged up from the lake bottom and was supposed to join the Flower and Rock Network and be taken up to the capital, but was, for whatever reason, abandoned. And so this rock lay on the edge of the lake for many, many, many years. And then, um, closest to the establishment of Liu Yuan, Xu Tai's father-in-law put together the money and the men and the boats to raise this thing off of the lake uh, bottom and uh, he kept it at his place in Huzhou on the other side of the lake. And then somehow Chu uh, Tai wanted it. And so it was taken back across the lake um, up to Suzhou and installed in Eastern Garden. So this rock has quite an exciting life. There's more chapters to the life of this rock, which I will not be able to get to today. All right, let's talk about calligraphy. Um, the first uh, format type that I wanna introduce to you is the plaque. This is an, an uh, engraved inscription, um, oftentimes in stone or brick, which is uh, often set into walls or over doorways. And um, I have a close up here. I hope you can see that this is um, a, a carved brick. The other type of format that I wanted to introduce to you tonight is kind of the similar shape. Actually, it's a long rectangle, but these are stone slabs, stone calligraphy slabs which are engraved with calligraphy and set into the walls of the garden. And we will talk about um, these in considerably greater depth. Now, neither I wanna just point out before I move on, neither one of these formats is, is at all unusual to Liu Yuan. You see these kinds of things in all the gardens. So um, don't think of it as, as unique to this garden at all. Okay, let's dive a little deeper into the um, owners of this garden and have a look at what they did in terms of adding things to the garden, particularly with an eye to calligraphy. Liu Shu, our retired official, was from a well-established family that had a um, substantial library. So he was a bibliophile, a lover and collector of books. He was an art lover of, of all kinds. He uh, patronized calligraphers, painters, other people like that. And uh, there were his dates. He lived from 1759 to 1816. 
when did he own the garden? He acquired the garden in 1797 when he retired from office and came back to the Suzhou area and then moved his house from uh, Dongting Dongshan to um, this uh, suburb outside the walls of Suzhou. And he lived there until his death in 1816. Now here are the names again, what did he call it? Hanbi Estate after his family home. Here again, the name is, is um, very significant. His, the family home was called Han Ching Lo on Dong Ting Dong Shan. And uh, so he made a kind of a little play on that, changing it to Han Bi, Han Bi Zhuang uh, for this, for the garden name. Uh, small building of Lowry Dock. We will explore that name a little bit more in a minute. And as I told you, popularly called, all the people called it Leo Family Garden. Now, what did Leo Shu collect? What did he add to the garden? Rocks. Leo Shu was one of those people whom the Chinese refer to as a fool for rocks. In English, we could say he was afflicted with lithophilia or petromania various uh, words indicating that he is crazy about rocks. And Leo Shu collected two different kinds of rocks. He collected Lake Thai rocks, such as we've seen, and he collected stone slabs engraved with calligraphy. He acquired the garden in 1797, as we know, and then he went about populating it. In 1802, just to give you one example of the things that he did, in 1802, he went on a kind of a buying spree. And over the course of just several months, he acquired a dozen uh, fantastically shaped Lake Thai rocks. And he, of course, had to name them a, as a particular grouping. And so they were called the 12 Peaks of Hanbi Estate. Not to leave it at the rocks, he also had to have them uh, documented in painting and calligraphy. And so uh, this painter, Wang Shui Hao, was actually a house guest of Leo Shu's for nearly a decade. And one of Wang Shui Hao's productions, not surprisingly, was a long hand scroll that has portraits of the 12 peaks of Hanbi estate with uh, their names up above and then comments about their appearance and that sort of thing written in calligraphy on the scroll. The um, detail of the scroll that I'm giving you here shows a rock called Shake Off the Sleeve. And I have an image on the right of a rock that I think might be that rock. I am no, no, it's certainly not um, marked that way in the garden, but it looks like the other one. So I'm going to guess it could be that original rock. Now, understand there's been a lot of vicissitudes visited upon that poor garden um, in the, in the, um, centuries since this time. So it's entirely possible that it is not that rock, but looks like it. Okay, the other type of rock that uh, Leo Shu collected, these stone calligraphy slabs. Now I love this particular shot here because I do not think, please correct me if you know differently. I do not think that someone in 1802 was putting plate glass over their stone calligraphy slabs set up in the walls. I mean, maybe they were, but I rather suspect this is a modern thing for tourism to keep people's hands off of the, off of the um, artwork. But I kind of love the effect because I think that Leo Shu would have liked the effect. If you, you, you're probably focusing on the calligraphy, but look at the glass and what you'll see is that the trees and the buildings behind you are being reflected in the glass. So I, I personally think Leo Shu would have loved this experience that you would be looking at the calligraphy, but at the same time, you would see the garden reflected in the glass behind you. And of course yourself in there as well. And it would be this sort of synesthetic experience of the, of the calligraphy, the garden, the people that are there, all of that stuff together. These are all through the garden. They're said to be over 700 meters of wall uh, throughout Liu Yuan. And um, these uh, frames of these uh, stone slabs appear just, uh, just everywhere. Here's the view down the hill toward the pond. You can see the, the, they look like windows from a distance, but they're not. They're, 
they're um, uh, glass frames. And then here's another uh, spot, a, a nice secluded courtyard that also has um, dozens of these um, slabs set into the walls with the uh, wooden frames and the glass over them. Again, they look like windows, but when you get closer, you can see that there's writing under there. All right, the most important um, component of these stone slabs are the model letters compendia that are found within them. And model letters compendia are a particular form of transmitting calligraphy uh, of a particular kind of calligraphy too. And the type of calligraphy most often found in them are personal letters, um, just uh, oftentimes family letters, letters that are, do not have any particular significance in the content. What's significant about them is the calligraphic style and the person that they are by. So these personal letters are always by famous past calligraphers. And these, what, what happens with these is that they are copied, engraved into stone, and then from the stone engraving, one can take ink rubbings off of them. They are in essence lithography. They are stone plates from which you can take a, lift a, an ink rubbing and make a print out of that. So this, these are the main ingredients of these stone slabs that are in, that Leo Shu put into the garden are these model letters compendia. And I wanna just say a word of, here about how these are produced. Uh, it's quite an elaborate process that involves a positive to negative and back again and that kind of thing. But um, it's remarkable how, how extraordinarily good these are. All right, what you wanna do is start with your original work of art that you're gonna copy, and then you make a trace copy over by putting a very thin sheet of paper over the original and then carefully tracing through um, with black ink. That's my first image on the left. Then in the middle, what I'm trying to show here is that you're going to flip the copy, the trace copy over, and then on the back, trace the characters on the back in a sticky red ink. Then that piece of paper is flipped back over again and the sticky red side is placed down onto the stone that is um, taken off. And then the carver carves the red characters out of the stone. That's how the stone is produced. And then if you want to take an ink rubbing from the stone, you need some damp paper and you need some ink pads. And uh, the paper has to be pressed down onto the surface of the stone and fit into all of the little crevices and crannies so that all of the writing will be picked up uh, in white when you uh, tamp the thing with the ink pad and turn it into a black piece of paper. As you can see this young man doing here, it's quite an art to make a good ink rubbing. So why would somebody collect model letters compendia? Well, this has to do with the uh, sort of moment in time for calligraphy at, at the moment that Leo Shu was putting his garden together. It was really the, kind of the only way to collect antique uh, calligraphy by this point. But by the 18th century, thanks to the omnivorous collecting practices of the emperors, most original ancient calligraphy was in the palace collection. And uh, I'll show you just a classic example of it here on the screen. This is a copy after a work by Wang Shijie. Wang Shijie, the great, the sage of calligraphy, the most famous calligrapher in the entire East Asian tradition. This is a, a copy after him, and it's called the Feng Ju Letter. And again, it's a, it's a, just a personal letter, or possibly even a fragment of a personal letter. Uh, it's named for just the first two characters of the of the letter, but you see where it is. It's in the National Palace Museum, Taipei, which means it was in the Qing Imperial Collection before that. So. Even a guy as uh, well-connected, wealthy, uh, socially elite as Leo Shu would have no chance to see anything like this. The only way that he could see it would be to collect model letters compendia. And so here you are. On the left here, in comparison, this is an ink rubbing of the same letter, the Feng Ju letter attributed to Wang Shijie. But this one is from a late Ming Dynasty model letters compendium that was produced by a man and his sons over a period of several decades. And the compendium was called Letters of the Two Wongs. And so it brought together all of these uh, uh, supposed ancient pieces by uh, Wang Shijie and his son Wang Xianzhe and were put together in this compendium. And then uh, this, the, that set 
uh, experienced some, you know, ups and downs over time. And, and by Leo Shu's day, it was sort of partially remained. And he was able to buy those slabs and to install them into his garden. And he obviously could also make grubbings from them and enjoy them that way. So even though he couldn't see the imperial collection, he could see a version of this letter and, uh, you know, study from it, copy it, admire it, whatever he wanted to do. Now, here's another question, though. Why would you collect stone calligraphy slabs instead of just the ink rubbings on paper? Ink rubbings on paper are wonderful. They're lightweight, they're portable, easy to use. I mean, I own some. So why would you collect great big slabs of stone that are essentially the lithographic plates for ink rubbings? Well, the answer to this has to do with literati garden culture in Suzhou and with the display culture that goes along with that. These stone slabs are elite literati culture art objects. Why? Because they have to do with writing, because they have to do with calligraphy, the most elite of the literati arts. They have to do with the literary project. And so they are the most elite kind of thing that one could uh, obtain. Secondly, they are expensive. If a, if a man and his sons take three decades to produce one of these things, obviously they're very labor intensive and expensive. Not many people made them, so they were hard to get. They were, uh, you know, a, a limited commodity. And what's interesting about this, these stone calligraphy slabs, particularly in the context of the garden, is that someone who had a collection of these things could in fact display all of them at one time, which is difficult to do with anything else. If you were, you know, if you collected scrolls of painting or whatever, you couldn't put them all out at once. Um, nobody would, would do that, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be sensible. But the fascinating thing with these is that by, by installing them in the walls, throughout the garden, someone like Leo Shu couldn't display that entire collection all at once. He could walk out into the garden on a spring morning and look around him and be surrounded, literally surrounded by his collection of calligraphy slabs. The other thing has to do with the, with the ability to interact with them. By mounting them into the walls of the garden, all of them, all at the same time, it was possible for uh, this man to invite his guests, his family members, people who were staying there for years at a time, someone like Wang Shui Hao, to invite them to walk with him and to look at the calligraphy. And they could pause, they could um, show their erudition by discussing knowledgeably about uh, other versions of this particular letter they might have seen or, or uh, something else by this calligrapher that they had seen at someone else's house. They could engage in con connoisseurship. They could say, you know, this is not as good as something I saw elsewhere or um, give opinions based on things that they had seen or comparisons even within the collection itself. So by displaying the entire collection at once in this uh, setting where a person could move and walk and stop and pause and walk on and come back, uh, it creates a, a complete environment for people to demonstrate their appreciation for calligraphy and for his collection, to appreciate um, uh, his, his garden at the same time as his collection, to display their own erudition, and to have conversations about connoisseurship. So it was a, um, a complete activity for um, uh, literati elites. And you could include yourself in the tradition too. I'm giving you an example here where I have marked off in this box on the right, here's a um, model letters compendium that has got a, an essay here by Song Lian, the historian, on the right, but then you'll notice in the center, this is a commentary by Leo Shu himself. One of these conversations or something about uh, various versions of uh, work by Zhao Meng Fu or someone else like that in, in different compendia that he had seen, he actually had these comments of his engraved into one of these slabs and this too was entered into the garden. So not only would there be living conversations amongst living and walking people within the garden, but 
that you could converse with the words that have been engraved in stone. So for example, Leo Shu's sons who inherited this garden, they could then talk to people about what their father had said about the calligraphy and the conversation would continue over multiple generations. All right, I wanna talk about plaques now. So I'm giving you right now a, a, a map, a plan of the garden of Liu Yuan. And my arrow here is pointing toward uh, number three on the, on the map, which is a, a secluded little courtyard that has a beautiful plaque in it that I want to talk about that uh, format next. Here we go. All right, here we are in the secluded courtyard. However, this vine is preventing us from really having a close look at this calligraphy. So I'm going to come back in winter when I can see this a little more clearly. And here is one of these plaques, usually composed of um, three or four large characters and then a dedication and inscription on the um, left-hand side that gives an explanation of the plaque, and its meaning and why it was there and that sort of thing. Now we're going to, uh, we would read it right to left in the traditional fashion. But I'm going to turn it around here below and read um, left to right so that I can line it up with the English. This is a uh, inscription in clerical script and it's using um, some slightly archaic forms. So I have, I have transferred this into the regular script uh, rendition of this. And this is the name for small building in Flowery Dock, which is another of these names that was used for this garden. And where did this name for the garden come from? This is obviously quite fancy. And of course, since it is a, a scholar garden, you know that the source is going to be something scholarly. And indeed, it is none other than the poetry of Du Fu. This uh, term, small building, comes from a poem by Du Fu called Weary of People. And the lines that are involved are, weary of people, I have made a small building. My odd nature is suited to lodging hidden. Okay, lodging hidden, what does that mean? That means reclusion, means secluding yourself away, the retired life living in your garden. So a small building is a place where someone goes to hide away and live in reclusion. Perfect, perfect name for a garden. Now you see there's, there's a smaller uh, inscription on the left and uh, let's go through that and see who wrote this and what this is all about. All right, this one reads, where my friend Rong Feng, this was Leo Xu's nickname, where my friend Rong Feng situated his villa in the Flowery Dock neighborhood of Flourishing Wu is said to be the old home of Lord Xu, the chief minister of Ming. Ponds and rocks of this place with its rampant flowers and trees has rather the flavor of the Hao River. All right, this is a wonderful old cliche, meaning that it is a beautiful bu bucolic place because those of you who are fans of Zhuangzi know that Hao River is where Zhuangzi looked down into the water and pronounced the joy of the fishes that they were, they were the, the fish were happy and joyful there. So this is a, a classic thing to think on when you're in a garden. So, see the happy, happy fish down below. And then it goes on. Now he has repaired and added to the old site somewhat. There are pavilions for enjoying the moon and halls to store his books. He invites old friends here to drink and write poetry. Truly, this is one of the splendid sights of Suzhou. And then we have a signature written by Qian Da Xin, the hermit of Juding in the first month of the Ding Su year of the Jiaqing era which equates to 1797. Qin Da Xin was a very famous man, uh, very famous as a scholar official and as a historian. He was also a very close friend of Liu Xu's father, Liu Jinsheng, who died in 1794. So I suspect that not only was this plaque done for the son, Liu Xu, to celebrate his garden, but I suspect that it may have had something to do with um, perhaps welcoming Liu Xu back to the world, because if, if his father died in 1794, if he underwent three years of mourning for that, it would be around 1797 or so that he would have come, sort of come back into society. And perhaps there was, I don't know, make this up, maybe some sort of party and, and Chen wrote this plaque uh, as a kind of a 
you know, beginning again kind of thing. As a calligrapher, Chen Da Xin was very famous for his clerical script. I'm bringing you in here um, an example of some ink written clerical script by him. Now, clerical script was dominant in the Han Dynasty, and hence uh, it, ha it always conveys this flavor of the um, archaic uh, script that it is. Of course, it's not a modern script type, it's an archaic script type used for art projects like this. So it had a kind of an antique flavor to it which gave it a scholarly air, of course. All right, I want to talk about Shang Kong and his uh, in, involvement with calligraphy in the garden as well. He um, was a, also a government official, very wealthy businessman. Um, the garden was abandoned after the Taiping Rebellion. Um, in 1860 and 1861 was a, um, when the Taiping Rebellion really flattened a lot of Suzhou, and particularly this area that was outside the walls, was utterly ruined during the during that time period. So the garden was, um, I don't think, being cared for by anybody at that point in time. So in 1873, Sheng purchased the garden, and then he took three years to complete some renovations to it, obviously to uh, uh, refurbish it. And then he made additions to it as well. He added land to it, much more, many more buildings, lots of stuff that he added to it. And what did he call it? Well, he called it Liu Yuan, not Liu Yuan. Interesting. So why is this? This, I think, has something to do with calligraphy. So I'm going to bring back my uh, plan of the garden here. And now my green arrow is pointing at the doorway that you see on the right hand side on this image here and above that doorway, as you can see, there is a plaque up there. You can see the green character above. And this plaque, which is uh, situated really at the beginning of the garden as you're coming through the last kind of uh, tight space here before emerging out into the open uh, view of the pond and the rest of the garden is where this plaque is situated. And I think that's kind of significant. Let's get up a little closer here and you can get a better look at it. Okay, this plaque is in seal script. So this, uh, for us to read this, it needs to be uh, translated into regular script characters, which you can see here, Chang Wei Tian Di Jian. All right, what is that all about? All right, this phrase could be translated as long remain between heaven and earth. And where does it come from? Well, of course, Du Fu. Du Fu's poem, Seeing Off Kong Chao Fu, who has resigned on account of illness and will go back to visit east of the Yangtze. And here, here is where the phrase occurs. Chao Fu tosses his head. He is unwilling to stay. He intends to go east to the sea, seeking mist and fog. The scrolls of his poems will long remain here between heaven and earth, but his fishing pole will brush against those trees of coral. So Du Fu is saying goodbye to his friend who is ill, perhaps going off to die, we don't know, and saying, however, that his, his poems, his poetry, his literary works will last and they will stay behind, even if his fishing pole, kind of his uh, symbol of his retirement, uh, will uh, brush against trees of coral, which of course are in the sea. So he's going to go off to the edge of the sea and become a kind of a hermit, perhaps even, dare I say, it, a bit of an immortal. Uh, but his, his um, scholarly works, his literary works will remain. This plaque has a kind of an interesting history. It is said that this plaque was actually dug up excavated from the edge of a pond during the time that Shang Kong was having the garden renovated. And I have circled for you in red here over on the left, there is a little signature at the end of it, just the style name, it says Bo Wan, just the style name of a 14th century calligrapher by the name of Zhou Bo Qi. Zhou Bo Qi was a specialist in seal script. So makes sense that our plaque is in seal script. 
Seal script is the most ancient of all of the script types. It has the greatest aura of antiquity of any of the script types that were used for art projects like this. In fact, it was not easy for ordinary people to read. And I've given you a little detail down below of a book that Joe Boachi produced uh, that was a dictionary of script types. And this is a section from the uh, uh, portion that talks about seal script. And you can see he's drawn out the seal script characters here and then identified them for the reader in regular script because they're not something that an ordinary person could read because they are so archaic. Chung Kong treasured this plaque. He displayed it very prominently, as you can see right before you come in, enter into the main part of the garden. So it's extremely obvious at the entrance there. And the question is why? Why did he treasure this? Cert certainly Joe Boachi was well known enough calligrapher, but why did he particularly treasure this object? Well, I suspect it's because this object was of a type. This was a kind of object that scholar officials revered. I think he saw it as an ancient object that had writing engraved on it, which had been sort of semi-miraculously recovered. Objects like that were believed to convey a kind of message from antiquity. The classic example of this I'm showing you right here on the screen is the stone drums. These are big uh, boulders that were engraved with poems. And they were rediscovered in the seventh century. It was quite a to-do when they, when they were discovered. They were thought to be from the ancient Zhou dynasty. It turns out they're not quite that old, but they certainly are old. So this kind of object, a stone thing with an engraved message on it in seal script uh, is like the most magical thing that could happen. It's something that is um, a kind of a communication from the deep past. And I think that's why Sheng treasured it so much. It was, he saw it as a recovered stone object from antiquity with an auspicious uh, message engraved into it. The message of course was long remain between heaven and earth. But you have to interpret a message. So how did Sheng interpret this message? Uh, a friend of his, a guy named Yu Yue, also famous uh, scholar of this time, uh, wrote a record of this garden called Record of Liu Yuan, in which he makes a few comments that, that kind of help me to see what's, what Sheng thought of this message from antiquity that was sent to him. So I'm going to read you a bit of this, of this record that Yu Yue wrote for him. After the destruction of the Taiping Rebellion, I visited the garden again. So you had known, the, I believe it was the grandson of Liu Shu that had the garden before then. So he had been in it before, but he went after, after the neighborhood was um, leveled. Uh, he, he wrote, uh, though the neighborhood around it was laid waste, its trees and rocks and secluded pavilions were still there, though choked by the undergrowth. In 1876, Sheng Kong acquired the garden. When he asked me to write a record of its restoration, I asked him, are you going to stick with the old name? He replied, no, no one could ever remember its proper name. They just called it the Leo family garden. So I'm not gonna fight that. Since they call it Leo Yuan, I'll call it Leo Yuan. I'll change the character but not the pronunciation. I said, what an excellent name. After all the destruction, everything else was leveled, yet this garden had the good fortune to not be ruined. Did not the creator allow this garden to remain, to wait for someone worthy? The splendors of its ancient streams and rocks remained for you to view. The beauties of its plantings remained for you to roam in. The seclusion of its kiosks remained for you to relax in. So much remained. Should we hold with the line from the Tang Dynasty poem that says, and all that remains is the wind and the moon watching over dense brambles? From here on, when I enjoy the splendid times and pure diversions here, 
I will understand the name of Liu Yuan as long remain between heaven and earth. In conclusion then, does Liu Yuan mean lingering gardener? What do you think the English name should be? I'm gonna to toss out a few options here. I'm sure you can do better though. How about remaining garden or the garden that remained or the garden that remained between heaven and earth? I welcome your questions. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so, so much, Amy, for that wonderful introduction to Liu Yuan. I've always wanted to know more about that garden. I've been there many times. It was always kind of one of my favorites, but I never really understood much about it at all. So I'm so grateful for you, for to you for having taken us into its into the depths of its calligraphy and its name, which Indeed, lingering garden is a very odd kind of, has a very odd ring to it. And I'm glad we now understand why it was called uh, Liu Yuan in the first place. So um, again, please enter any questions you might have into the Q&A box and I will pose them to Professor McNair. Um, but I'll just first start by asking, um, do you know anything about how Liu Shu actually collected those stone slabs um, that were engraved with model letter compendia. Um, do you have any sense of what the market for those things was like? How did they circulate among collectors? Was there, was there a particular place that people went to, to buy their um, stone slab model letter compendia? Uh, I think you had to know the, the people. I think you had to know who had them and I think you had to make a deal with them to get them, and and they they were pricey. Um, th uh, sometimes they were um, given uh, to people, and at the same way that like tie rocks were given to people, they could be part of somebody's dowry or as a as a gift of some some way or another. The the thing the pieces that Leo Shu collected is interesting. They were um, never like the complete set. They were always oh. fragmentary. And and older, like the 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 one that I was talking about was from the late Ming Dynasty. So that had, you know, that had been, it was like 150 years old by that point. So mm -hmm. I suspect that there wasn't anybody that was particularly a broker for those kind of things. I think it was that one family knew another family, and and things like that occurred. And I do know they also, um, I, I know one story is a, that one of the owners of the master of the Nets Garden did not like calligraphy slabs and he sold the ones out of the garden. Oh really? Amazing. Yeah. Oh. So some people actually don't like them. Oh. Wow. Um, we have several comments about names for the garden. Um, okay. <laughs> one suggestion is the garden that lingers between heaven and earth. Oh nice, uh, nice, nice. Another um, has a strong preference for the garden that remains between heaven and earth. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, and so uh, there's another question just about antiquarianism in general in the 18th century. Could you fill out that context a little bit more for us? Um, why did people care about things like seal script or uh, clerical script all of a sudden in the 18th century? Why were they collecting these old compendia, et cetera? Yeah, 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 okay. Um, this has to do with um, Confucian studies uh, and, and the return to um, Han Dynasty materials. Uh, Confucian scholars believed that Confucianism had been uh, polluted by Buddhist and Taoist thinking uh, you know, over the centuries and they wanted to go back to uh, the original true Confucianism. So they returned to Han Dynasty documents before Buddhism ever invaded China. And so that got them interested in those old things. And so they went back to old documents and started looking at, then looking at genuine Han calligraphy and, and got excited about it as an artistic inspiration, it, not just as historical sources, but, but for the artistic inspiration. And then they just started going back and back and back in time from that point onward. They first, they loved the Han stuff and then they went back to, to Joe materials and, and, uh, onto bronze inscriptions older and older and older until finally oracle bones were rediscovered and the oldest form of writing and then they went crazy for that and so they used these super ancient script types as inspiration for their for their own calligraphy. Thank you. Yeah. 
Um, there's another question about the stones that were used uh, in the garden. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about both where the kind of sculptural stones were found, but also do you know anything about the stones that were used for the model letter, letter compendia? Do, oh, what kind of stone was used in those slabs? Yeah, I, that, I'm just curious. I, I've always kind of wondered that. Yeah. I really don't know a thing about what kind of stone that is. Sorry, yeah. No problem. What about the more sculptural stones? Um, were, were they really found at the bottom of lakes? <laughs> um, to my understanding, yes, they come up from the bottom of the lake, but then uh, they were sometimes enhanced <laughs> by the workmen who, who um, made some of the holes a little bigger or made the shapes a little funkier or whatever. And then they would be put back into the water and, allow, and the water would, you know, uh, change their forms a little bit more. So there, yes, there certainly was some manipulation, make no mistake. Plus, um, an, any number of rocks is, that look like they are a single entity are in fact a compilation of, of pieces. But, you know, typically so artfully done that you would have no idea. Yeah, that, I, you can see that very clearly in our garden, that <laughs> there are some quite elaborate bases that are pieced mm -hmm. together to support ro larger rocks. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, one, uh, one attendee um, comments that he, he thinks the glass coverings for the stone plaques were probably installed in the 1950s when the garden was converted from a private garden into a um, tourist site as part of that general government yeah. campaign. Um, that's That was always my assumption as well, that yeah. the, the, the glass really was uh, <laughs> a kind of tourist deterrence. Oh, I think so. Mechanism. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Um, going back to the question of antiquarianism, though, uh, how is good all the Japanese art curator from LACMA points out that the 18th century interest in antiquarianism in China kind of parallels something that's going on in Japan at the same time. Mm -hmm. There was the Kankugaku kind of nationalist studies movement um, that also arose in the 18th century. Do you have any more general sense of uh, kind of spread of nationalist interest around East Asia in the 18th century? Can, can you comment on that at all? Uh, of nationalist interest? Yeah. Uh, well, I assume that, th that everybody was suddenly made aware of the situation of dealing with the West, right? Which was uh, uh, so ultimately cataclysmic for China. Um, so yeah, the, the, the idea of, the idea of um, thinking about the, the great antiquity of Chinese civilization and what a strong and amazing uh, tradition they have was, I, I think, important to people. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I think that's, I think, a great point, that sudden awareness of the mm -hmm. outside of Europe in particular, mm -hmm. the Americas, I think really did lead to some kind of inward looking um, tendencies in both China and Japan, and mm -hmm. probably Korea as well. Um, could you mentioned at the beginning of your talk that you've been teaching calligraphy and teaching gardens. Um, and could you tell us a little bit more about your actual pedagogical techniques for these classes? How do you, um, have you found any particularly effective ways to discuss calligraphy or gardens with students? Are there assignments or topics or discussions that students have really responded to enthusiastically? Um, within these courses? Um, I find that one of the most satisfying things to do in terms of teaching calligraphy is to have students talk about style. You do not have oh. to be able to read Chinese to be able to look at brushwork and talk about, to, to observe and to, to describe differences between script types and between the styles of calligraphy. You don't have to read a word of Chinese to be able to analyze that. And I think that students find it really satisfying that they can you know, really kind of delve into it and, and see the differences between things and see what the effects are that certain calligraphers strive for and without having to read Chinese at all. Have, are there particular readings about calligraphy that you found effective in, in encouraging students to 
take such an approach to choreography? Um, do you have go-to readings? Do I have readings for them? Go go-to readings that you always assign for your calligraphy lectures. Yeah. Um, there, there are certain things that I do love to assign uh, uh, students to read. I'm sure you know Lothar Lederrose's uh, article about uh, Taoism. Yeah, I mean, that, that is a, a great one, talking about uh, um, automatic writing and uh, re receiving inspiration and the, the calligraphy coming out of that. And uh, I don't think that students remotely consider that there's a, there's a religious or spiritual aspect to calligraphy until they read that. And then they think, oh my gosh, that's, I had no idea. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that's one of my favorites. Um, to switch from calligraphy back to gardens, mm -hmm. um, could, could you talk a little bit more, or could you compare the OUN to some of the other gardens in Suzhou? Are there yeah. commonalities, differences? Um, just very general. Um, one of the one of the funniest um, comparisons is this this man named Yu Yue, who was this friend of Shen Kong's. He too had a garden. It was called Chuyan, which was the exact opposite. I mean, to you know, in in gross terms, the exact opposite. It, it, it very small, very modest garden, very plain, that sort of thing. So those those two contrast very strongly. Uh, yeah. Liyuan is pretty opulent. Um, it has, you know, it has a lot of a lot of really uh, eye-catching rocks. It has all that calligraphy everywhere. It has a lot of buildings. Um, the 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 one hall I didn't show this this time, but the hall that has the all of the artwork in it that looks out onto the what's called the Five Immortals Peaks, that, which is a huge range of rock composition. I mean, there's nothing else like that. That's the I believe the largest building in a in a garden in Sujo. So it's it's you know uh late Qing opulence, you know, it's very uh, sort of loud, whereas other gardens are much quieter. Now um Lion Grove is just is too full of rocks, excessively full of rocks. Zhuo <laughs> Zhengyuan is um fun if you have all day because it's so large. You know, it takes a long time to wander through that. And that is a garden that's about water. So if you like water, if you like canals and, and lakes and ponds and, and uh, you know, views from one bridge across to another to another, um, that's a good one for that. Uh, Master of the Nets is considered a, you know, kind of a jewel, right? Just like a perfect little jewel of a garden. So each one has their own personality. Yeah. Thank you. Um there's a question about whether you found any fictional literary resources helpful in your investigation of <laughs> gardens and their visual or poetic culture. Well, the opening assignment in my gardens class is chapter 17. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that and that is uh, that is a fantastic introduction for American students to the Chinese garden because it's it's all there. Every component of a Chinese garden, they're going through it. Uh, uh, value is trying to name uh, the the sites and the and the places, and and it isn't going well. And his father is too critical, and it 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 just it's a uh, it gives you everything from how wealthy people lived to how you deal with a garden and what the expectations are of an educated person, all the way into you know Chinese child rearing practices. You know, it's a fantastic introduction. But that chapter 17 of the story of the stone is something that I ask all of our docents to read as well and that I've yeah, assigned good. to students and it, truly when we named the sites in the Chinese garden at the Huntington it, it felt very much like what was being described yeah. in that chapter yeah. Right? Yeah. although we were doing it in imagination rather than in person since we mm -hmm. named mm -hmm. sites before they were built yeah 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 um, another really good resource is, have you looked at this um, Dumbarton Oaks anthology of writings? There's so many beautiful poems in there. And I, and I had my students read um, poems by um, uh, Shangguan Wanner, who right. was Empress Wu's uh, yes. personal um, secretary. She has some beautiful poems on, uh, on gardens that, that give you very much the sense of the um, sounds, 
the sounds and the, and the smells and stuff of gardens too, which is an aspect that, you know, we need to always have in mind too. So there's some wonderful stuff in that book. Um, have, there's a question about, have you visited the Zhang Dachian residence in Taipei? Um, do you have any sense of how it compares to the lingering garden? No, I'm sorry, I haven't. Is it, is it, a, is it modeled on that? I'm not certain. I've never visited it either, unfortunately. Oh yeah, no, I would love to know more about it. Yeah. And I'm also curious, you showed in, in Liu Yuan the example of uh, an inscription of Liu Xu's own commentary mm -hmm. next to mm -hmm. the Gaolian, Gaolian yeah. I think, um, calligraphy. Do you, do you know when his editions um, were produced? Was that done during his own lifetime? Was that something that his descendants did in honor of him? Um, do you have any idea about that process? I asked those same questions myself when I was looking at that, and I and I have not had the time to look into that. I would like to look into this more as a project. Frankly, I'm just, I mean, uh, it's super exciting, and and I don't know. And I do, I do think that that garden went down to his grandson. I think I know it was oh, wow. passed to one of his sons, and then to the grandson. And I think the grandson was some kind of profligate because I I believe <laughs> that the that the garden was then lost from the family out of that point. So I, I thought that I had that same question you have, who did that? Did Leo Shu do it himself? It seems like it's a classic thing that the son would do. Yeah, exactly. Right, yeah. And I also was curious, um, when you were looking through those calligraphic slabs, um, were you able to tell, I'm assuming that there are multiple collections within the garden. Are you able to tell just by looking at the, the state of the slab, um, you know, whether it was something from the late Ming that Liu Xu purchased or whether it was something from the early to mid Qing that had been produced recently or something like that. I, I, I'm not an, an expert that would be able to know by looking at the stone or anything like that, but, but model letters compendia have titles on them. Right. So if you see the title, you know which one it's coming from. But see, he did all these mix and match things too. He bought these fragmentary collections and then he added to them. And yeah, it, with uh, either pieces that he had gotten from somewhere else or he would, he would um, have something engraved himself and add it to there. So he confused the genealogy of these things even further. And so um, even experts like Rong Gung, who you know, wrote volumes on model letters compendia and and you know put all the contents in them and that sort of thing he, even he had trouble um extracting back out what leo shu had woven together to make the whole collection that's in his garden that's fascinating it is amazingly it's very tangled because he did some of his own he had some of his own collection engraved and then he bought pieces of these other ones and then those have been dispersed some of them are in the in the um um, Confucius Temple in Suzhou. Uh -huh. There's a handful of them there, and the, it's it's quite a tangled story. It really is. I, I loved your description of how these slabs might have been used, sort of in daily mm -hmm. life. The the notion that you really were displaying your entire collection on the walls of your garden, and that you really could wander through and study for your own benefit, or use them as almost props for discussion or points of discussion, but it's, it's such a different approach to collecting and to mm -hmm. dis the display of collections mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. really anything else one, one mm -hmm. sees. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating. Yeah. So I think with that, I will thank you again for your absolutely oh, yeah. enlightening lecture. I'm so glad that you introduced this garden to us and took us into its calligraphy. And I really hope that you'll develop this into a full project. I would, I really would love to read that. So. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for coming. And thank okay. you everyone right. for being Thank here. you everyone. Yes. Good night. Good night.